Rob Walters, your Oxford guide, presents the Invisible College of Oxford University. Imagine an ancient invisible college where the members included people who extracted the spleen of a dog, predicted man flight, including to the moon, drew a magnified flea, discovered how gases behave and how springs stretch, and defined the structure of the brain. A wondrous thing. The intriguing title, Invisible College, has been applied to a number of societies formed in that most exciting of centuries, the 17th. A period of unrest which fostered futuristic leaps in scientific, spiritual and political matters. One of the Invisible Colleges was intimately linked to Oxford, Its invisibility was not that suggested by the invisible man. No, it simply implied that the college was not a building or a location as such, but an association of, in this case, men. In fact, the formal name of this invisible college was the Oxford Philosophical Club. A college, not for students, but for intellectual giants, on the shoulders of which scientists today surely still stand. But why was it called the Philosophical Club when its members were predominantly interested in science? Well, that's easy. The term science as we know it did not become popular until the 19th century. These giants of the 17th century would have called themselves natural philosophers, and they regarded their interests as just part of philosophy in general. Clubs of this sort often form around one person, and the focus here was undoubtedly one man. His name was John Wilkins. Let's have a look at him. Though not famous for any one specific advance, he is the star of this show. He was schooled and educated at Oxford, obtaining an MA degree in 1634, aged just 20 years. His career then centred on the church, being ordained as a priest at Oxford's Christchurch Cathedral, though he always had an interest in experimental philosophy. In 1648, soon after the Royalists lost Oxford to the Parliamentarians in the Civil War, he became the warden of Wadham College in the city, another star of this show. Wilkins' wife was Oliver Cromwell's sister, and at the end of his life, Cromwell granted Wilkins the Mastership of Trinity College, Cambridge, allegedly making him the only man to head colleges in both cities. Though originally gathering at the lodgings of William Petty, whom we will meet later, most of the meetings of the Philosophical Club took place at Wadham. So let's have a closer look at this college. It was founded in 1613 by Mr and Mrs Wadham, and the frontage that you see here is pretty much as the original. In Wilkins' time, meetings of the club were held on Wednesday afternoons, in the main quad or in the warden's lodge immediately above the main entrance, and then later again in the lodgings of Robert Boyle, which were located in what is now University College. The far-reaching scientific span of Wilkins is demonstrated by his book, in which he describes a mechanism whereby man could reach the moon. However, it is based on a limited understanding of gravity at that time, and is approximately 300 years before its time. In his second book, Wilkins introduced man-flying machines, together with reports of some attempted flights, though he does conclude somewhat dryly that the truth is most of these artists did unfortunately miscarry by falling down and breaking their arms or legs, yet this may be imputed to their want of experience. Let's have a look at the better-known members of the club. 
Most famous, perhaps, was Christopher Wren, who studied at Wadham itself, earning an MA, followed by a fellowship to All Souls College, then later again becoming the Professor of Astronomy at Oxford. He was a man of many parts, though best known for its architectural achievements, the Sheldonian Theatre in Oxford and St Paul's Cathedral being but two. Yet, he was also well briefed in anatomy, mathematics and, of course, astronomy. He cut out the spleen of a dog, which classical medicine identified as the source of black bile, supposedly an essential humour for a healthy body. The animal recovered, thus disproving the ancient theory. Wren was closely associated with another member of the club, Thomas Willis a medical doctor and researcher. Willis led a team that sectioned the human brain to investigate its structure, and Wren used his graphical skills to prepare the illustrations for Willis's famous book on this subject. This investigation discovered the essential ring of Willis, which provides a reliable arterial blood supply to the brain. They also sawed open the brain of the unfortunate young student from Wadham College who was tragically struck dead by lightning in a boat on the Thames and they found that his brain was undamaged. William Petty, an anatomy instructor at this time, was also a member of the club and it is he who began the dissection of Anne Green, a young woman who had been hanged at Oxford Castle for infanticide. As he raised his scalpel to the corpse's face, he was shocked to perceive that her skin was still warm. He administered the then equivalent of smelling salts, and Anne coughed. She had somehow survived the hanging. Robert Hooke was the first man to portray a world beyond unaided observation in his famous book Micrographia, which included this famous drawing of a flea. His works were many and included the law governing the extendability of springs named after him and a claimed first discovery of the law of gravitation before Newton. Hook was a student at Christchurch and became a laboratory assistant to that famously rich and wise Robert Boyle, who was also a member of the club and is sometimes called the founder of modern chemistry. He gave us Boyle's Law, one of the gas laws, which he determined using a vacuum pump implemented by Hook. John Wallace was primarily a mathematician, but like all in the club, he had wide interests. He was the government's chief cryptographer for many years and became the professor of geometry at about the same time that Wilkins came to Oxford. He is credited with advances in calculus and for creating the related sign for infinity. Did Wadham itself benefit from the presence of Wilkins and the club? It certainly did. In the 17th century, its garden contained a rainbow maker, a talking statue and a glass beehive for studying the colony at work. Many of the Oxford adherents had strong links with those of similar interests in London, where there was a physical college, Gresham College, established to provide a series of public science lectures. In fact, some of the members of the Oxford Club, including Christopher Wren, were professors there. In 1660, following a lecture by Wren, a Gresham Committee meeting was held to discuss the establishment of a new institution. This is generally accepted as a starting point for what, in 1663, became the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge, nowadays simply called the Royal Society and, as highlighted, half of those present at that historic meeting were from the Oxford Philosophical Club. The Society's motto in English is Take Nobody's Word for It. And now, some 360 years later, it describes itself thus. The Royal Society is a fellowship of many of the world's most eminent scientists and is the 
oldest scientific academy in continuous existence. It is a great honour to become a fellow. So, there you have it. From the 17th century group of scientists in Oxford that got together to experiment and share their knowledge, right through to the Royal Society of today with its array of learned scientists. Hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, by the way, if you're not subscribed, please do so. And don't forget to click that notification bell. Bye for now. Bye-bye.